Yesterday, looking frail and wearing a face shield, the 74-year-old D'Angelo confessed to 13 killings and almost 50 rapes. Like a movie villain, D'Angelo would also taunt his victims over the phone. You have forfeited your right to live at all. Sorry. You shall be executed in a method provided by Florida law. This is Jeremy Lee Moody and Christine Moody, a self-proclaimed white supremacist couple from North Carolina who are facing charges for the brutal murder of a registered sex offender, Marvin Parker, and his wife, Gretchen Dawn Parker, in July 2013. The heinous crime unfolded when a neighbor called 911, reporting a possible disturbance at the Parker residence. When deputies arrived, they found Marvin and Gretchen Parker dead, shot at close range with a 380 handgun, and stabbed. Surveillance footage led to the arrest of Jeremy, 30, and Christine, 36, who were subsequently charged with two counts of murder, kidnapping, and firearm possession. However, a real shocker came when Jeremy Lee and Christine Moody unleashed their madness in the courtroom. During their sentencing, the Moody's initially asked for a 30-year sentence so they could see their children and grow old together. But their true colors emerged when Judge Lee Alford handed down consecutive life sentences. This is how they responded. Jeremy brazenly taunted the victim's family. Calling them unprintable names. Christine wasn't left out. She echoed her husband's lack of remorse, stating, Do you have any regrets? I have no regrets. Killing that pedophile was the best day of my life. Their chilling lack of remorse was further evidenced by their plan to target more sex offenders. I had to do it over again. I killed more. Moody's revealed they had another sex offender in mind as their third victim, but were caught before they could strike again. Lawyers claimed that both Jeremy and Christine were sexually abused as children, fueling their desire for revenge against those who hurt them. Psychologist Harold Morgan, who analyzed Jeremy, suggested that they believed they had a divine assignment to kill all sex offenders. The Moody's were also linked to a white supremacist group, Crew 41, known for targeting sex offenders. However, they denied that the Parker's murder was related to the group. The murdering couple were sentenced to consecutive life sentences. However, this wasn't the only time a convict freaked out during their sentencing. Take, for example, the case of Alex Murdoch, a prominent personal injury attorney and heir to a powerful legal dynasty in South Carolina. On June 7, 2021, Murdoch reported that he discovered his wife, Maggie, and his son, Paul, dead near the dog kennels on their sprawling estate. After over a year with no arrests, Murdaugh himself was indicted on two counts of murder and two counts of possession of a weapon while committing a violent crime in July 2022. While the crimes committed by Murdaugh were reprehensible, his conduct in court will make your blood run cold. Throughout the trial, Murdaugh insisted on his innocence, but state prosecutors presented compelling evidence against him. They argued that he had shot his wife and son at close range with a rifle and shotgun, allegedly to distract from his financial misdeeds and gain sympathy. Uh, but it is overwhelming, and it shows this man to be a cunning manipulator, a man who placed himself above all others, including his family. The prosecution's case relied on circumstantial evidence, including mobile phone data and gunshot residue, as no murder weapon was ever found. However, the most significant piece of evidence was a video taken by Paul at the dog kennels. Quit, Gash. Quit. That's okay. Come here. Oh, hey, he's got a bird in his mouth. Which contradicted Murdaugh's previous claims about his whereabouts that night. Murdaugh's defense team argued that he was a loving husband and father who had been unfairly targeted by law enforcement. However, the evidence suggested otherwise. In a high-risk move, Murdaugh testified in his defense, acknowledging that he was at the dog kennels before the murders and had lied to investigators due to a long-standing addiction to prescription painkillers. He also confessed to years of theft from clients to fund his drug abuse. After 20 months of denial, 
He admitted during the trial that he had lied. I don't think I was capable of reason, and I lied about being down there. However, he maintained that none of these actions proved his guilt, and tearfully declared that he would never intentionally hurt his wife or son. I'm innocent. I would never hurt my wife Maggie, and I would never hurt my son Papa. Despite his denial, a jury found him guilty of all charges after less than three hours of deliberation. He stood emotionless as the judge pronounced his sentence. On each of the murder indictments in the murder of your wife, Maggie Murdoch, I sentence you for the term of the rest of your natural life for the murder of Paul Murdoch, whom you probably love so much. He now faces 30 years to life in prison without parole, as prosecutors decided not to pursue the death penalty. However, while Murdaugh's reaction was shocking, it's nothing compared to the utter mayhem caused by Joseph D'Angelo in court. Joseph James D'Angelo Jr., born November 8, 1945, is an American serial killer who terrorized California from 1974 to 1986. He committed at least 13 murders, 51 sexual assaults, and 120 burglaries, leaving a trail of fear and devastation in his wake. Throughout his crime spree, he earned different nicknames in the press, including the Vesalia Ransacker, the East Area Rapist, and the Night Stalker. During the decades-long investigation, law enforcement faced numerous challenges as they sifted through suspects and false leads. After years of intensive efforts, a breakthrough occurred in 2018, when investigators charged Joseph D'Angelo with eight counts of first-degree murder. Based on DNA evidence and forensic genetic genealogy, the announcement also connected D'Angelo to the Vesalia Ransacker crimes. The true shock lies not in the crime itself, but in D'Angelo's jaw-dropping behavior during the sentencing. Due to California's statute of limitations on pre-2017 rape cases, D'Angelo could not be charged with the rapes he committed in the 1970s. However, he faced charges for 13 related kidnapping and abduction attempts. In June 2020, D'Angelo pleaded guilty to multiple counts of murder and kidnapping, as part of a plea bargain that spared him from the death penalty. But the district attorney still believed he deserved the death penalty. I honestly believe that this person, not even a person, this beast, deserved the ultimate punishment of death. Several family members of his victims read emotional victim impact statements. My father caught him twice staring in my bedroom window and tried to chase him down, but was unable to catch him. He was wearing a ski mask and pointing a gun at me, saying that he was taking me with him and that if I made any noise, he would kill me. D'Angelo fired two shots, hitting my dad. He then turned the gun on me as I was down on the ground. My only thought was, this is it. I put my head down, expecting him to kill me. After listening to victim impact statements during the sentencing, D'Angelo only offered a brief apology. I've listened to all your statements, each one of them, and I'm really sorry to everyone I've heard. Thank you, Your Honor. On August 21st, 2020, D'Angelo received multiple consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. However, just when you thought you'd seen it all, another convict surpasses D'Angelo's wild courtroom display. Enter Armin Mivis. In March 2001, Mivis posted an advertisement on a now-defunct website for people with cannibalistic fetishes, seeking a willing volunteer to be slaughtered and consumed. Berns Jorgen Armando Brandes, a 43-year-old engineer from Berlin, responded to the disturbing ad. They met at Mivis's home, where they recorded a horrifying video of Brandes consenting to have his penis amputated and consumed. Tragically, Brandis also ingested a lethal combination of pills and cough syrup. After the mutilation, Mivis killed Brandis by stabbing him in the throat. Then I took the knife, grasped it in my hand, and after hesitating some more, I cut his throat with it. And hung his body on a meat hook. He proceeded to dismember and consume the corpse over the following ten months storing the remains in his freezer under pizza boxes. The shocking case came to light in December 2002, when a college student noticed Mivis's new ads for victims online and alerted the authorities. 
In January 2004, Mivas was convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to eight years and six months in prison, a decision that garnered significant media attention. During his trial, he admitted to cannibalizing Brandis and expressed regret for his actions, hoping to deter others from following a similar path. That this can never be the right way. The wishes, the fantasies you have. That these can never ever be fulfilled. However, in April 2005, a retrial was ordered, and Mivis was reconvicted of murder in May 2006. A psychologist's assessment indicated that he still had fantasies about devouring the flesh of young people and could reoffend. He received a life imprisonment sentence for his heinous crime. However, while some may attribute Mivas' reaction to mental illness, it pales in comparison to the unfathomable behavior of Mark Latunsky. Mark Latunsky, a 52-year-old man, charged for the horrific murder of his grinder date, Kevin Bacon, on December 24, 2019. Latunsky and Bacon met through the Grinder dating app, and Bacon's body was later found in the basement of Latunsky's Bennington Township home on December 28, 2019. The discovery came after Bacon's roommate reported him missing when he didn't show up for Christmas breakfast. During the trial, it was revealed that Latunsky pleaded guilty to the gruesome murder, admitting to stabbing Bacon in the back and slicing his throat. Do you use a knife to stab Mr. Bacon? Yes, I did. Even more shocking was Latunsky's admission to consuming parts of Bacon's body, including one of his testicles. After Mr. Bacon was dead, did you remove part of his body, specifically his testicles? Yes, I did. In court, Bacon's family expressed their anguish. But because of someone who decided to take our son's life, that isn't the case for us. Only 25 years old and had a great career as a hairstylist, and hadn't been able to graduate from U of M in psychology, even though they were kind enough to honor him his degree. Such a short life for our son, who had a lot to do in this world still. Kunsky's criminal history was marred by encounters with the police before Bacon's death. In some incidents, individuals managed to escape from his home, describing him as a terrifying and dangerous person. Despite these alarming incidents, Latunsky was not charged, leaving a trail of missed opportunities to prevent the tragedy. He was eventually sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The case exposed Latunsky's mental health issues, including major depression, paranoid schizophrenia, and traits of personality disorder. His ex-wife and former husband were aware of his history of mental illness, which led to his hospitalization. However, they could not force him to seek consistent treatment, leaving him to stop taking his medication. In court, the judge has some words for him. Serious sentence, that of life with no possibility of parole. Latunsky remained unremorseful as he was sentenced. If you thought these reactions were shocking, You'd be amazed at this video of reactions of innocent convicts set free.